Hello and welcome to a very special episode of How Would I Quilt This? How would I quilt this? Well, we... All of this. All of this. <laughs> so what we did was we asked on what do people want us to talk about because we have two book clubs coming up in the next two weeks or next two months that we at and it's because of travel schedules both for Pam and myself and us going to market Mar festival. So... We wanted to make sure we had stuff out there, so we asked fans, what do you want us to do? And they said, how do you quilt this? So... And they sent us many, many pictures. I have enough to actually break it up into... A couple of episodes. Two episodes. So yeah. this is the first one. The second episode will up at the end of October. So uh, we're going to dive in and each give our perspectives on the quilts right. that we've gotten. So we've randomly mixed them up based on all the submissions that we got. So... Hang tight, and we're going to head to the overhead shot and talk about quilting. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to show you how we would quilt different quilts. So the best thing we can do is to print out the quilts that you all sent us. And this is um, transparency film. Transparency film that we used to use in the old days for old Heads. You could print on it from your printer. And yes, all that fun it was so fun. And we're just using one of these dry erase markers and a little eraser so that we can each kind of draw our own version of how we would quilt this. Um, so this is from Stacy. She it's flying geese. Um, I don't know that that's what she calls it, but geese. that's what I called it. <laughs> so and these are rows. So I think that that kind of lends itself to things that you do in rows. Um, I'm going to go first because Pam will, um, I'll steal Pam's ideas or she'll still. Well, I get to go first on the next one. Okay. Okay. So the flying geese, I'm just drawing a bigger one so I can show you how I would go into each one. But, um, I kind of like the idea of doing, you know, because you don't want to spend a ton of time doing kind of an orange peel within it. Um, you don't like an orange peel. If you prefer a lemon peel or same, same grape, or, or, or I mean, I mean, that's very different. Yeah, that is totally different. Um, <laughs> lime, a lime, or a lime peel. Um, the other thing you could do is you want to do something either in the center or both sides. Yes, one needs to pop. You don't need one to mash needs, them all down. You don't need to mash them all down, or you could do every other one something. So Orange peel would be one choice, or I I have a tendency to stitch in the ditch and do like hook thing that would fill that up, and then go and just have that hook in every one. Now that hook in every one, the thing that I would do in this row to match it, I would make myself a vine of different hooks. So then that would give me, and then that's really easy to do up and down the, and you could do one hook going down, you could do one hook, um, so, but that would tie those two together. And then with this border right here, I don't know that I wouldn't do some ribbon candy in that border. The little skinny one. The little skinny black one. And it's, I on this not that I have a problem drawing on it but it's so small I wanted you to see it bigger that's the reason I'm doing it on the side that would be my first instinct to do something like that that's cute that's cute let okay <laughs> let's let Pam do it okay. okay and when I come this way there's a little bit of a glare so I, I'm, I'm here shove I'm over gonna, sister I'm gonna move out of your way <laughs> so unlike Lynn I am gonna draw on the quilt because that's how I um, the first thing I would tackle here in these big rows is honestly, I would follow the line that you've got in the fabric and mimic that bag. And that gives you just a really nice way. You're not trying to go too crazy with trying to follow a design, freeform some things. And that's very easy to do on a walking foot. So that's easy to do on a domestic if that's all you've got to work with. Now, when I think about quilting flying geese, and they're all right next to each other. The thing that gets me the most is how do you travel from one to the next? Good question. That's what kills me about. It. And you're like traveling back over the ditch, and it's eh, it's a whole thing. So what I'm inclined to do is pick a design, and in this case, I think I want to 
spend more time quilting the background of the geese so the fabric choices within the geese pop. So I'm going to quilt down the wings and not the body. And in order to get that traveling, let's say you're coming in probably from the, the top up here. You're going to have to do a ditch and then come back. And then I like a nice geometric fan effect. And you could mix it up and come at it from different corners if you want. But that would be an easy thing that you can do. You don't need a quilting ruler to do it. But you can come and just kind of do these lines. You could curve them a little bit. or right? And then you're already down here at the next one. And so you have to think about how you're getting from the top of one row and all the way down. Now if you're doing this on a domestic machine, you want to be careful that you're not skewing your entire quilt if you're using a foot, like you start at this row and then you keep moving slow over and over and over by column. Your fabric's going to have a tendency to kind of skew a bit. So just be mindful when you're doing it that you're alternating the direction that you're coming at the quilt so you're not skewing the whole thing down one way. Long arm, that's not an issue, but just on a domestic, I know that's a thing that can happen pretty easily. Um, I do think like Lynn, ribbon candy would be cute in this little skinny border, but if you're just not up for that commitment, a nice straight line in from either side or even right on the ditch is, is a lovely addition as well. Okay, Stacy. Stacy, that was great. Thank you for that one. All right, our next one is from Robin, and it is a sampler quilt. Okay. So, a sampler quilt. You said you were going first on this one. Oh, I did? Yeah. Stuff to erase. Oh, okay. You want to so erase I'll, my thing? No, I'll do it. So, I, okay, anytime I'm faced with a sampler quilt, I want to sample all of my quilting stuff. Um, <laughs> wow, that's yeah. descriptive. <laughs> what kind of stuff, Lynn? Lines and <laughs> lines and things. I would go in here and treat each block uniquely. So I would do, you know, a um, line of the basket and maybe make it look like a basket and then do some orange peels in here and do a meander in the background. Then I'm going to do either some kind of ribbon candy. And ribbon candy looks like this, right? Or I actually like L's, which I think you call wishbones. Yeah, I like to stretch mine out a little more just so I get more bang and don't have to quilt as much. And to me, they look like L's. I've practiced L's my whole life. Well, your first name starts yeah, with an L. It's very Laverne. It's very Laverne-ish. So I like wishbone, so that works out well. The thing when you're doing any kind of ribbon candy or wishbones or any kind of thing that goes in a line, when you're on the long arm, you do not, you have to learn how to quilt it this way, this way, this way, and this way. Because... If I can't do an L like this, you're very limited on your ability right. to do Right, you L's. have to stop and start and keep going back. So you need to be able to do them up and down and then side to side. So, and that's just a tip for practice those things. Again, I know we talked in other videos how you have to practice, but um, sincerely, practice. Now, I, I will say that I would treat each one of these differently. So if this is a flower, I'm going to come in here and make little flower stuff in each one. Mm. You know, I'm going to come. That looks like, I don't know what that looks it's like. It's like a little sewing machine. It does look like, okay, that's it. So I'm going to take the sewing machine, do this, then I would go up and down here, and then I would do something across so that I would mimic the sewing machine. Again, you can come in here and do um, a little flower inside that point and then I would maybe do mimic the flower outside of here because that looks like a bigger one this would be cool where you're going to do the up and down and then I would do side to side up and down and then do some kind of circle thing in there um, the elephant I would definitely outline his head and his trunk and then maybe do some back and forth in here meander in the background and I would keep either my ribbon candy or L's, like, consistent throughout. But I would treat every one of these different. Hmm. Now, and if I had a lot of time, I'd be changing color. There's nothing wrong with a pantograph on a sampler quilt also nope. if you do not want to commit to custom stuff. Okay. So, in similar vein, Lynn, 
but without requiring as much thought. <laughs> I like the idea of custom, but I find it very daunting to think, oh crap, I need, th I need to think about quilting 30 tiny quilts. 30 blocks that are all different and you're treating each one separate. Another strategy that's a, a little more, or, or excuse me, a little less if you think like, okay, everywhere I've got yellow fabric, I'm going to do this particular design. I'm going to do a swirl in all my yellow pieces. And so you're going to get a swirl in the center of this. You're going to get a swirl in the center of this. And so you know, as you're your way around the quilt, oh, every time I hit yellow fabric, I'm going to put a swirl in there. Every time I get to a black fabric or um, I think this might be navy, I'm going to do switchbacks. So you're just going to do, uh, and switchbacks are just parallel lines like that. And you can size them up and down, you know, so you can fit a variety of shapes in there. Now the one exception to me would be the bird and the elephant because those are very specific animal shapes and you may not want to fill your elephant with switchbacks. That just feels like a crime against endangered species so uh feels being, like he's in jail if like, you do switchbacks those would be the like when you've got legit applique shapes here um but i would commit to a design for each color and it may not be the same pink block but every time there's a pink oh i'm going to do a meander and a pink or something like that um and if you've got a domestic or a long arm uh I tend to do the same thing within uh, all my sashings. I like to do a quarter inch a walking foot away from the edge and you end up with some nice crossings in your cornerstones. And then I would, in where you get to the outer borders, do something a little fancier, a little ribbon candy happening or, you know, the whole switchback thing. So that's what I have. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Yes. For the sampler. Okay. So our next one is from Rhonda, and I call this one Rhonda Rainbow because Rhonda didn't tell me what else to call it, and I do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, and you've got the same block, so you could pick a design for the block and repeat it over and over, and you've just got different colors. And that would be a very cute look if you're using a variegated thread because especially if you get one that picks up, like, all the colors, and then that helps draw it out. Now, the only tricky thing is when you're picking a variegated thread that matches the rainbow when it crosses over the white you're gonna, that's going to be very prominent and if you're at all worried about consistency or shape or my curves always have corners i don't know anything about that but <laughs> if you're worried about that that you may want to just pick a lightish like a lighter variegated rainbow and that way it blends with both of them a gray is a safe one on that yeah if you want, if you wanted to hide it, a gray would be safer. Minimize. Minimize. Right. Minimize. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could always go monofilament. Right. True. There you go. True. So when I start thinking about this one, what stands out to me is the idea of the crisscross that you're getting with these blocks. And you could go all in on doing, like treating the quadrants as units and traveling your way around there. So that's one option where you just do that around all the blocks. And that's a pretty low key, easy to accomplish, not a lot of custom. If you wanna go a little crazy, <laughs> like Lynn might be getting ready to do. I'm thinking about she's it. She's pulled a pen out, she's, getting, <laughs> she's trying to sketch. Too bad, I got the picture. <laughs> so your other option then is to only quilt in either the color or the white depending on what you want to pop because the one you don't quilt in is going to puff out more and the one you quilt in will recede a bit so your option there you could do that same kind of you know easy to do Whoop, my pen's not quite writing where you go pen you know and you're having to trick your way around a block <coughs> excuse me and so that can be a little mm, interesting. So depending on how you want to travel, that's another way. Um, an easier thing is that orange peel design we've already talked about, where you pick an entry point and you basically work your way around the block. Now the trick is to do that, you can't complete the orange peel. You have to like partial orange peel it. So you go on all of your outer and come down and do that. And so it looks real dodgy at first, but you just, you make your way around the block and then you end up back at the same spot you started. Okay. 
Cool. All right. So I, I'm looking at this, and to me, everything in here is a, it's a, an hourglass. Like the, every square is really an hourglass shape, right? Or, you know, similar to a quarter square triangle. It's not exactly, but it's an hourglass shape. So one of your hourglasses is going to be white, and the other one is going to, the two sides will be a color. Right, so you've got white and color. So I don't know that it depends on if I want um, the white to stand out, but I would treat each one differently. And there's nothing to say that you cannot make a you can't make a shape to fill the shape, right? So you know if you were wanting to do um, some kind of hook flowers, I kind of like. You know, there's nothing wrong with that um, to do those kind of things. And you could do something different in here. So I don't know that I wouldn't come back and do a zigzag in here. Travel zigzag. Right. And when you're practicing, don't do what I just did. You, When you're practicing on paper, you want to make sure if you're a long armor, and this is true with domestic too, um, don't lift your pen and then put it down someplace else because as soon as you do that you've automatically cut the thread hair made yourself bury it and you know drop Whoa. new thread yeah Thank drop new that. thread there so don't do that um i kind of like something like that that would be opposite every time because you've got you know you would do it the if you're doing it the white with the hook flowers and the switch back on this then you've got different choices and you can do that throughout the whole thing and really that's only two patterns so pick out two patterns that you like and then treat every time you see white you do, it's kind of like what you were saying in the sampler every time you see white do something every time you see that do something else now i think i know you said rainbow but for some reason this looks like stars to me mm -hmm. kind of thing so i would definitely um I would definitely do something fun in the in the borders um, and whether that is you know uh, McTavishing do you all know what McTavishing is? let me turn this over so you can see so in the border I don't know that I would do a McTavish which is um, I think about it as bananas, bananas? no <laughs> it I looks think a little like bananas it does like stacked bananas a lot of banana kick is that it? Yeah, Ish. maybe. So I think about it. So the way somebody said it to me is that you're doing like drawing hair, you know, weaving hair. I don't know. So you're just going to keep like it's just a filler. And you just do it three times. So you come in here and you do this. And then if you run out of room, go the different way. Well, except they can't see because your hand's in the way. Oh, sorry. Well, it happens. It happens. <clears throat> it's a hazard so you on. see, I kind of feel that. It, so that's what I would do kind of in this border is you could make Tavish the border, um, which I think is kind of good. It's hard to see that. I'm drawing bigger because this picture is so much smaller. I would also treat the, I don't know that I wouldn't treat the, um, the setting sashings. You know, if you want, if you're doing this kind of image in the sashing, there's nothing right that says that you can't do those, you know, along a line. Or you could come in and do circles, right, along the sashing. I think that would be kind of interesting, too. Okay. Okay. Are we? Thank you, Rhonda. We, thank you, Rhonda. Next, we have Lucinda's Tumblr quilt. So this has a lot of floral fabrics in it. If I hold it up to the camera, um, there's a, it looks like maybe strawberries and flowers and dots and like a lot of cute stuff happening. So the first thing that I would do is stitch in the ditch, which yeah, kills my soul a little bit because, uh, but you end up doing that and you can do it pretty easy, you know, walking foot style if you're on a domestic. Um, and then if you're doing long arm, depending on how you've loaded it, like you could load it sideways because they don't know your life. 
right. you know, <laughs> so you can do it that way. Um, or alternately, you know, you come in from the top and, and I don't have a sense of how tall these tumblers are because I don't know how big Lucinda's quilt is. So you may or may not leave some of these unquilted so they pop. Um, if I did that, I would leave the next one unquilted just because I think it's also got a lot of print to it and it's uh, very fun. It looks like there's bunnies or deer and frolicking in that fabric. So then you could do the same thing we talked about before where every time you run across one of these fabrics, you get the same pattern within the tumbler. So like this blue check always gets, you know, swirls and then they're nested, you know. So that's an option. I think because you've got a lot of flowers and leaves going on, you could definitely lean into some leaf motifs. Uh, but if you're going to do that, I leaf motifs in the non-leafy prints. So the ones that look more like background prints, um, you can come in and just make it a little, little art statement. Flower, fill it in, doot. You know, so you could do little portraits within each block. Now the other thing we've got going on here is a lot of uh, plus signs on some of the, the um, prints in the fabric motif that you could draw out as you're traveling from block to block and you're going to end up going back over your stitch in the ditch lines. And that's why I said stitch in the whole thing that where you've got those to rely on as travel lines to get to the next piece. I like it. Now, let me be honest with you. I have quilted a Tumblr quilt that have my own. So I can tell you what I chose to do on it. And I did graffiti quilting. Um, Carly Porter is kind of known for this, but essentially what you do is you you start and, and it's kind of like this is I've used as many motifs as I can in a small space and I just keep changing motifs. And so I didn't pay any attention to where the lines were. Actually in this piece I drew my own lines. Um, but what I did in this works with any kind of one patch quilt and this is a one patch quilt because it's the same shape just repeat over and over this quilt will look great with a pantograph on it but if you want to do graffiti quilting what you're going to do is you're going to now I'm a long armor so of course I start up here so I'm going to take a long like uh, line and then I'm going to double back on that and do some feathers now I will give you real honesty my feathers are free form and happy so but I will come back in here and do different stuff in the feathers do either the, I do those hooks a lot just so you guys know I'll come back in and do hooks in them and then once I'm done and I get up here then I'll go back here and do that So I'm doing, and I'm not paying attention to where anything is in the quilt, as in, because it's a one patch quilt, it allows me to ignore the patch and just quilt the way I want it to. And I would do this back in there, and then I would echo this. And if you ever get stuck in what they call graffiti quilting, echo is your best friend. You just echo your way out of there. And then when I get in here, I may do, you know, a big hook and then do bumps out of that and bump back into there and then do another big hook bumps out of that bump back into here now and if I get bored in that I may do some f some circles or pebbles to get out of there and this me literally playing and practicing all I want to and if it doesn't look like I want it to look then I go back and I stick something in the middle of it like for example if you're making a flower you're like that's kind of jacked up okay how can I change that and not make that look jacked up we'll go in the middle of here and then add some stuff are you using for your jacked up flower? Lee? Um, I would, because this is, and you know, when I, 
what I would do is I would pick out a cream and I would do the whole thing in that. And honestly, when I did my graffiti quilting too, is I wrote stuff in it and I'm always on quilts. Um, and this is one place to practice. Now you guys know that, but um, so I've written sayings in here. I've written scriptures in mine. I've written I am statements. I, just, I will fill it in with whatever, you know, is happening to me. A lot of times Carly does, um, well, that's jacked up. Arrows. Arrows. And then she'll echo those arrows. Right. And when you do that, you end up covering a lot of territory. And let's say you hate that. Then go back in here and fill it in with pebbles. Pebbles. Our favorite. Our favorite. Somebody said that the other day. He hated pebbles. Like, I don't hate them. They uh, just take time. We just time. think they're a bad idea once you get started. But they look so good. Um, so, uh, or, you know, you get done with that, then do some McTavishine, you know. So I honestly, this one patch quilts are the best quilts to practice quilting and to pr practice graffiti quilting. So if you don't have a plan and you don't want to do an all over, but you want to practice, this is the best kind of quilt to practice on because the patches are always going to be the same. Now, that's a lot of custom. That's a lot of time. It just depends on what, if this is going to be for, you know, someone and they're not going to appreciate that, then don't do it. You know. Do you want to go first on this one? No, go ahead. All right. Yeah, right. So, thank you, Lucinda. Yeah, so, thank next you very up, much. we have the and her snowman table runner. Okay. Snowmen. They like cold? They like snow? You picking up what I'm laying down? I am picking it up right there. So. And I think you're going to steal my idea. Go ahead. I am, because that's how we roll. So, <laughs> in the snowman himself, I. So right now, I think she's already got the buttons attached. Honestly, if you're doing embellishments, the best practice is to put those on until after you're done quilting. Because what you don't want to do is have that get in the way, get caught up on your machine, accidentally hit it with a needle, needle, and throw possibly your, and throw your timing, timing off. off on your machine. It's a bad idea. So uh, if the buttons weren't, there, what I would do with the snowman is you know you come in from the side and you start mimicking like a big swirl. Now, because you've got a scarf there, once you hit that, whoops, once you hit the scarf, you've got to travel a little bit on the edge and then keep your swirl going on the outside of that because you want that. I would leave the scarf unquilted just so it pops, but you want to stitch in the ditch around it. And then you could do the same thing on his face and kind of skirt around his nose there. That, I would, you know, just do some switchbacks. You could emphasize the the band, if there is a band on the hat, I don't think there is, um, but that's another place to embellish too if you want. So in the background, I think, you know, you've got a fun thing on with snowflakes. You could go and freeform and just create new snowflakes, but you know, it's supposed to be very symmetrical and very precise and- um, No, they're not. You, you may, just saying, especially if it's like Christmas Eve, <laughs> and you're like working on this as a gift just saying uh, <laughs> no not at all not so at all. what you could do is come and just do a very dense stipple around all of the little in the background and that way they're popping again if you're doing that you want to make sure that you have stitched in the ditch all the way around your little snowman dude so stitch in the ditch around your motifs in the star in the center uh what i would be inclined to do is start from the center and do like a wavy thing hook and come out and just have that mimic and act like it's a snowflake yep okay all right i've blown it up so that we can talk about it i like the idea of snowflakes I like the idea of snowflakes all the way around so how i would do a snowflake is once i drop my needle i would come up make a circle travel back down down make a circle travel back to the center out make a circle travel travel circle travel back circle 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 all right then i'm coming back to the center and i've either got to go over to one come over here circle so see how you can travel making spikes 
you know, I'm going to run out of room. I'm just running out of, um, and they don't, yes, they have to be precise in, in, um, ish. They have to be precise in nature, nature, but because not. Because the crystalline structure needs integrity so it doesn't collapse <laughs> upon itself. But this is cool. And you've got batting in and, for that. And you've cool. watched Frozen, so you're going to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. All My right. niece has discovered Frozen, the youngest one. <gasps> She's like all in on the Elsa dresses. Oh, yeah. Like I get calls from my niece. Do you get an Elsa or an Anna braid? So she gets a, 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 an Elsa braid. Because it's only one and she is slow. <laughs> the patience is whatever. So, but I like the idea of inside the snowman. And this is, let me look at this. These are pretty big. Like, that's a pretty good size table runner. So, I think inside the snowman, you could be, it'd be really fun to mix up pebbles and swirls. And then just give your snowman kind of a pebbly, swirly background. And I think that would give a unique kind of texture, and I would do all that with him. For the, for the scarf, I would kind of want to do some mimicking to what it is. Now, are you changing thread colors for all of this? Uh, knowing me, let's be honest. Yes. Yeah, I am. Um, so because I change thread colors, I can come in here and pick this up. I like that. Of course, you're going to go back. I would do the whole Santa face. Um, swirls and that kind of stuff so i like that the whole idea of this snowflake kind of thing in the background and i would have treat i'm kind of leaning towards the way you i would treat this unique so i would come in here and i like your idea of the hook things i would make this fancier and maybe even go outside of it so i'm not just treating where the white is but i'm also going and i would i would make that the most intricate snowflake on the because that's going to stand out right i want this to be the most intricate snowflake on my table runner with this being my background so that being my background okay. but that's really nice kathy thank you so much for sharing that with us all right next up on the snow theme we have janet's snowball quilt so nice two block quilt two colors two blocks it's simple so in this design, what I want to do is treat the white fabric with the red fabric another way, because that is how I roll as a quilter. So my inclination, when I'm not sure what to do, I do orange peels. <laughs> and so I'm coming in with the red, and I'm picking a corner, and I'm traveling around that block. And you have to go outsides first. And then you end up having to come and fill in this part, you know, the inner loop. Is so if that's how you treat all your reds and likewise corners here, like you've traveled back to here. Now you're doing this and now you're and you're doing this. Do, do. Now the trick is if you want to use one thread color, I would go with a light gray or even a light pink. That way it's going to blend a little bit with the white fabric. It's going to blend in with the red as well. Uh, and that, that lets you not have to break thread when you're going crossing over from the red to the white. Because this field of the white snowball is so big, I would, you know, pick up and do like a giant swirl. Or if you want to, you could mix it up and you could do a flower. Um, it depends. I can't tell if there's a print on the white. If it's a flowery print, then you could certainly, instead of a swirl, if you want to mix it up as you've traveled, you do your little thing and then you start. It's a chrysanthemum, I think. And that's a fun way to fill that in as well. Now, if you want to get real fancy, real fancy, real fancy, like you could use legit flowers. You could be like, ooh, this is my iris block. Granted, I don't really know what an iris looks like. <laughs> It's got this kind of thing. There's like big floppy leaves, and you could like do a flower, a different flower in each block. I don't know. Block. It was the snobby flower in the. I think it looks like that. It was the snobby flower in Iris in Alice in Wonderland. The iris was okay. Just saying. I know it's purplish, so yeah. that fits with my pen. Well, some of them are. Yeah. yeah. So I would treat all the nine patches with some orange peel treatment, and then pick a to me a, a an oversized filler 
that's going to draw attention to the snowballs themselves. And then in the border, um, because I've chosen to do orange peel on all of the red, there's not a good solution for that here unless you just want to, using the lines of the blocks to indicate the border. And let me, I'm going to turn this around just so I'm not dragging my hand across it like I'm in second grade <laughs> getting black all over my hand. Uh, thanks, school system. <laughs> so you could mimic that here. It's going to require a little bit of marking. And a ruler. And a ruler. Probably. You know. So that's how you get that effect, just by traveling around that whole border. But you'd need to mark, just because you don't want to finish your orange peel out where the binding's going to cover it. So a little bit of marking, a little bit of patience. All right. Okay. So anytime I've done stuff with a snow block, a snowball block in it, I always want to know. And remember, I don't quilt a lot for other people. I usually quilt for myself. So I like the idea of this has got some theme for me. Like just a red and white quilt. Some th usually there's a reason I made it or whatever. So when you're dealing with a snowball block, you've got tons of space in there to draw. Right? Um, and I don't know if it's like I know that I did this one where I came in and I created this teacup right you know who's good for those kind of motifs is Lori Kennedy and then you can come back in here and then that's your teacup you can go in and do you know you can do any of those little kind of small motifs and so then you would do all those teacup kind of things the other Thing you could do is if you want to write a message or put somebody's name on it these snowball blocks are the best place to do that and what you would do is you would come in and let's say you're going to you know write Amy because um, that's your granddaughter's name or whatever so you would trace with some kind of washable marker the A right so that this is traced on your you know snowball block right now, and then when I come in with quilting, that was just, that's already written on there. When I come in with quilting, I'm going to meander the back of this. Real tight? Real tight to where that is down. And then just go on the outline of this. And then that A is going to be embossed on there. Right? So, and then you're going to have to meander in there and meander in here. And then you can write messages with these snowballs by just tracing that font without applique. Um, in one of my big quilts, I wrote... Um, coffee is not my cup of tea. Yeah, coffee is not my <laughs> cup of tea all the way around it. And that's the name of the quilt is coffee is not my cup of tea. And I literally printed out a font I liked. I traced around the font and then I meandered really tight in the background, which gave me lots of room to... Um, for that to stand out and you have to get close to look at it i do like pam's idea where you go in and do the um the the orange peel but i would normally for a i'm just gonna have to redraw all of these i'm sorry i just need more room more room to draw okay so what i would do that would be super easy because i'm a i'm a checkerboard lover and it's funny my husband posted a quilt the other day that i had made one of my first quilts and it had a checkerboard on it so like i've not fallen out of love with those yet so what i would do is i would do the switchbacks here get here and i would do this and then here i would do this and those are super easy and it's a good way to travel around a block and not be locked right. in of like oh crap i ended in the center right <laughs> yeah and what color thread um I, you know i honestly if this is just a um red and white quilt i i probably would be white on the whole thing um unless i wanted these a's to stand out and then if i did or the lettering to stand out and then i could do those with red thread which would be really cool against that white, but you've got to be pretty secure that you're okay with your quilting because that's going to change the look of this. Mm -hmm. This has got a really clean look with a red and white quilt. If you did red on that white, it's going to change the look of it. 
So, not that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it will. So, Janet, thank you for the snowball block. We appreciate it. All right, next up we have Georgie and the Good Fortune quilt. And I will be honest, I have made this quilt. I started to say, it and here's familiar. how I quilted it. <laughs> meandered the heck out of it. <laughs> la, 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 la. Uh, and the reason I did that was... It's a big quilt. It's a big quilt. That's not why. It's a big quilt with a lot of tall, tiny pieces. And there's already a lot going on with the piecing. And so you can either super duper lean into that and be very specific and custom quilt all the tiny pieces. I ain't got time for that. Um, so on mine, I did treat the center so everything from the background here on this little kind of sawtooth border inside of that sawtooth piece got treated with a meander because I'm like the blocks are cool that's they're lovely I who was a lot of look I did do a little bit of custom when I got to the outside though so uh, the actual little sawtooth themselves got a little bit of the orange peel treatment you know because I'm nothing if not predictable and I think I just did a meander here in this piece. And I think, did I end up adding more? I think this is the one I did the Halloween version of. And I ended up adding a couple borders to mine to make it big enough uh, because it was gonna be a gift for someone that had a queen size bed. And then I ended up in this outside border. And the other reason is I was doing it on a sit down machine, I think. Yeah, I was. Come over here for that and use Lynn's long arm. No, and so to manage the bulk of this, I couldn't use a specific motif and have it look good consistently because the amount of weight that was potentially falling off the table was tugging on it. So once I got closer to the edge and I had more of the bulk of the quilt puddled on the table, I could have a little more flexibility to do something fancier in the border. So that's what happened with me there. Um, out here order I think I ended up just doing the orange peel again and you've got two different sized ones when you're doing that. You have to do a little bit of traveling to get from one to the other but you know that's not that big a deal you're just picking you know this line here so if you want to go ahead and stitch in the ditch all the way around you could do that with a walking foot if you want you've got that traveling line to go back to. Ta-da! Okay, this one would be incredible custom quilted, honestly, it would. Mm -hmm. But if I were doing that, you want to break up the design to be unique to this block, unique to this block. So to make it easier on yourself, whatever you're doing custom in here needs to be in every one. And whatever you're doing custom in here needs to be in every one. And I would make something, because this... This nine patch kind of line gives you this neat, unique kind of uh, chain piece kind of thing where you're getting this look across the quilt. And I would make that stand out. I don't know if I would do a, a vine around it that I can mimic the whole time. So I'm doing a vine. You mean Irish chain? I'm thinking Irish chain, okay. but just yeah, yeah chain. So, I, you know, then the vine would come down so that it's crisscrossing. Um, by the way, I don't have a problem crossing threads. Nope. Not this at all. This is not Ghostbusters. This you can cross is, the streams. Yeah, I don't have a problem doing that. So I would kind of do a vine across that. And then I don't know that I like the kind of um, long blocks that these are. So I don't know that I wouldn't go up and down on those switchbacks, I think Pam calls them, on those. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I would do this in white. I would do those in orange because um, that looks orange to me, orange or red. I think it is orange. Yeah. And then in this block, I would not, I would stay away from the vine or anything like that. And I would do something that is going to not be as heavily quilted. If this is heavy quilted, right? If I'm heavy quilting these blocks, I'm not going to heavy quilt these blocks. And that gives me dimension that I like. Um, and not everybody loves to mention, but I sure, certainly do. Um, then in this, I would treat every, whatever I'm doing in this, and I think I would like a maybe a leaf pattern in here, in each one of these. If I'm doing a vine, I'm going to do a little leaf, you know, in the, the, the 
corners of that triangle, right? Do a little leaf pattern in each one of those, and however the corner, the triangle is faced, I kind of like mimicking that. I'm bringing it out to the edge, and then when I'm when I'm out here, I don't know that I wouldn't maybe mimic the vine in a smaller form on that um, border, and then I'm gonna do a bigger leaf or more dimensional leaves out here in this one, and then do, and then I would just kind of. I would do a vine everywhere I could do a vine except for this block and that way it's going to be a part of it but in this block I don't know maybe do a flower maybe do something but it's not as heavily quilted as I'm doing these so that I get more dimension that I like out of it but it's a gorge you know um, body hunter does just design gorgeous quilts and that anytime you do one they're gorgeous now that being said these are also very pretty pantographed. Mm -hmm. Also very pretty pantograph. So All it doesn't right. have to be custom. So, thank you, Georgie. Good luck with that giant quilt. All right, our last one for this episode is Deborah's Bento Box Quilt. And I have seen this pattern done many times. I, this is one of the more stunning versions I've seen with it with prints. I see a lot of people do it in solids. Lynn, I don't know if you've seen this pattern a lot. I actually have this pattern, but okay, yes. Cool. So, what I... And really? I bought fabric to do it, but I haven't done it. Yeah. I know we're all surprised. Shocking. 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 So I am definitely inclined to, to follow the lines of the box. And in that way, I am doing, I think what, I'm, what I would end up doing is opposite quadrants. I'd do the same design in this quadrant as I would here, here, and here. And so I'm going to have, you know, these three things are going to look the same. And then there's going to be something different in the skinny bits. And then I pick a different design here. So I see, you know, in the fabric here, you've got a nice dot print. And so you could come and just do a nice big squeaky marker effect. <laughs> so do some giant pebbles. Um, and then, you know, you mimic that in here and you work around and as you get to this next section, you've got a different design. And so you could do switchbacks very easily and then come and do your giant pebbles and then switchbacks. And then you kind of work your way. You could either start from the out inside and go out. So there will be a little bit of thread breaking just because the traveling up to the next strata or the round of the box uh, gets in the way you don't want to cut your design in any way so uh, that's what I'm inclined to do there now depending on how big these skinny pieces are you could leave them unquilted but you would definitely want to stitch in the ditch around it just so they're set off a little bit and you're not having kind of a weird puffiness that you didn't intend to um I wish I had gone first because that's exact. I think she's talking about exactly how I would handle this custom wise. Uh, I think you could do some really kind of cool 3D effects, maybe where you could do some uh, ge geometric. I think you want to stay fairly geometrical yes. with this quilt. You don't want to um, do anything kind of swirly and twirly kind of thing, um, just to give you some interesting. I like the idea of, of dividing it up and conquering it. Um, I think you could do some pebbling. One just to kind of be off, um, different than what you've done before. I think this does lend itself to a really neat um, all over design, free motion boxes. And how you do that is you just draw and keep drawing boxes and crossing over boxes. And that would give you a kind of a neat box kind of effect that you're mimicking, but it's easy to mimic. And just draw boxes. It's kind of a different meander, but instead of doing any kind of whirls, you're just making sure that every turn is a right angle. Right? So you're just making boxes. And that would be interesting on that. So you could do some geometric, do this, and maybe treat. And I would do each one separately. But what I would do is whatever I've determined to how many go out, 
So it looks like one, two, three, four, five, maybe Limit. number. Then I would just start repeating that. So it's the exact same in every one. That way it would um, be easy to do, easier to remember. But I'm just repeating the same kind of, you know, design. So if I'm doing this kind of thing in the center, then this, then this, then I know the next thing that I'm going to be doing is, I don't know, oh, yeah. zigzag. I would just try to mimic as many kind of um, designs, shapes. Yeah, sentences. it's hard for me to draw. Talk at the same time. I'm like waiting for the uh, for the, my story to kick in my iPad or iBot. Or, my phone, my earbuds, things. Lafayette? No, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> y'all, that's, that's about all I know about Hamilton, y'all. It's <laughs> yeah. just so Lafayette. Yeah, really. exactly. So, but I would do, find all these different kind of, and then like triangles. That's a starish triangle thing, but yeah, cool. You know, do triangles. Do that and then just kind of keep those whatever you've decided just keep it up okay so so that wow, is wow these were tough I think interesting but fun yeah thank you Deborah yeah so that is a wrap for the first episode the very special episode stay tuned next month for the second part of this I know y'all have to wait a whole month but it's gonna be worth it. so thanks for tuning in uh, don't forget to check out the rest of the channel. Wish us well as we're traveling and we'll be back next week with more videos. Thanks.